Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Institute of World Politics. Uh, my name is John Lachowski. I'm the founder and president of the Institute. Uh, as for those of you who are new to the school, we are a gra an independent graduate school and not a think tank, although we sound like one. Uh, and we offer five master's degree programs. We have a relatively new doctoral program, the first one in the nation in national security affairs. And uh, we also offer individual classes here where one can take a class without committing to a whole semester's worth of tuition and the, all the application processes for a degree program. And we have about a hundred of these extracurricular events every year to which you are invited. Uh, I am just delighted to be able to welcome an extraordinary uh, visitor to the Institute, uh, a distinguished authority in his field who is actually a very rare commodity in Washington, uh, Steve Van Roco. Steve. Uh, is one of the pioneers in, in uh, the computing uh, industry in this country. He was uh, discovered uh, early on by Microsoft, where he uh, spent the larger part of his career uh, working uh, as the, the um, longest serving business and strategy assistant to the founder of Microsoft, Bill Gates. Uh, and his final role at the company was senior director of the Windows Server and Tools Division, uh, which at his departure had risen to be the second largest revenue generator for the company. Uh, Steve has, from, from there, he found his way to Washington, where he has served in several different fascinating capacities. He uh, served in uh, the Office of Management and Budget as the acting deputy director. Uh, he had positions at, at USAID and at, at, at the FCC. <clears throat> he also served as the, the second chief information officer of the United States, uh, working out of uh, President Obama's White House. And uh, in, uh, in, in that capacity, uh, he uh, led the creation of all sorts of programs, the portfolio stat uh, agency review process. He launched the FedRAMP uh, cloud computing program. He co-founded the U.S. Digital Service and the Presidential Innovations Program. He also led the U.S. government's open data and mobile policies. Uh, he then was sent by the White House to lead USAID's efforts in, uh, uh, to combat uh, the Ebola epidemic in Africa. And uh, when I learned about this, and, and uh, I was just blown away by uh, the initiatives that he took and its relevance to, the, uh, to, to our mission here at IWP, which has everything to do with studying all of the different arts of statecraft. We teach diplomacy, public diplomacy, which includes everything from exchanges, visitors, programs, information policy, but then it segues into foreign assistance, political action, strategic influence of different kinds, all the instruments of soft power, and how they are integrated with traditional diplomacy, military power, intelligence, and the other things like that. So uh, I thought it would be a wonderful thing for Steve to come and share with us his extraordinary experiences. And without any further ado, let me introduce to you Steve Van Roke. Thank you, John, and thank you. These chairs up front look really nice. And so you can feel <laughs> Um, I've given this talk a few times before in different formats, and a few times people thought that that guy on my French side was going to come out and give the talk, and he looks a lot cooler than I do. Um, <laughs> did I say that you're with me, Rockefeller? From you did not. That's okay. Yeah, put Can the I come up here just? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried to go seriatim through your career, but. Steve has had an association with the Rockefeller Foundation in New York for a number of years, and just after I invited him to come 
and give this talk. He was appointed as the chief operating officer of the Rockefeller Foundation. So he's in an, an incredibly strategic place to do a lot of good for the world. And he was telling me before we started that, uh, that, that they, the foundation is moving back towards its roots uh, uh, concerning the relationship of science uh, to building uh, a better world. And so maybe you might even say a word about sure. it, too, if that's <laughs> <It's> appropriate. <laughs> sure. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry Thank you very much. No, no problem. <clears throat> Not at all. Um, no, it's really fun. Other than the commute to New York, because I still live here in D.C., the, uh, working at the found Rockefeller Foundation is incredible. It's a really old institution founded in uh, 1913. I think it's one, maybe the second oldest uh, U.S.-based found uh, foundation, and and the focus uh, there for us is uh, health, uh, kind of global health, mostly focused on maternal and child mortality, uh, food, so it's my, uh, malnutrition, micronutrient delivery, that sort of stuff, and the future of food, um, and climate change, and all the things that relate to our food ecosystem, and uh, power, energy poverty, as it relates to you know the impact of extreme poverty for those people that don't have electricity and can't read at night, cook in a clean environment, things like that. And so we, uh, we tend to use science and technology to tackle many of these things across the, across the planet. And it's an incredible, incredible organization, a really rewarding place to, uh, to work and to, to work alongside a lot of folks. So I'm going to, uh, you know, the talk today, I'm going to take you back a, five years ago um, in 2014, spring of 2014, about right now, is when the world started to hear a little bit about Ebola in Africa, West Africa. Um, we were able to find out through our through our uh, the science of sort of discovering and tracing cases that a little boy in Guinea uh, climbed into a a tree stump, a hollow tree stump, and it was either bitten by or touched the guano of an infected bat. Uh, bats are the only mammals on the planet that can carry Ebola and not uh, succumb to the disease, um, and either through an open wound or, or a bite, um, this little boy got sick, and uh, and it led to this chain reaction across Africa, West Africa that I'll talk about um, in a second. Uh, but first, I'll talk a little bit about Ebola and what is what is Ebola, and I promise this talk won't be just like Debbie Downer the whole time. Uh, but it's. Uh, you know, Ebola is a terrible, terrible disease. It, it's a, it's a, in a class of diseases called hemorrhagic fevers. And I'm not a doctor, but it's a, what a hemorrhagic fever basically does is it's a virus that will attack the linings of your cells and, and basically dissolve the lining of the cell or attack the lining, break the lining of the cell in such a way that you hemorrhage the contents of those cells. Um, and when you see someone with Ebola, they tend to be uh, very lots of fluids are involved. So in, in every way, lots of fluids are involved. Some sweating and everything else you can imagine is is happening. Ebola is also a very aggressive disease. It will it will uh, take your life in about five days after contact and after uh, you have uh, contracted the disease. And um, it presents one of the major challenges is it presents as a fever initially, which many diseases you can catch in all over the world, including Africa, present as a fever, which, which creates a lot of problems because somebody might say, oh, this is malaria, this is something else, I'm in Mar you know, and I'm going to wait a few days to see if I, if I get better. But if you wait a couple days, it, you tend to not get better with Ebola very quickly. Uh, the other major problem we have, and you, we'll talk about this later, is you are most vir virulent with Ebola um, at the point of your death. Um, so the moment you're dying, when you're hemorrhaging the most fluids, is when you are most likely to transmit the disease to someone else. Um, uh, the good thing about Ebola in that context is it is human-to-human -human contact. So meaning that it's not airborne. Someone coughing at a distance is not going to give you Ebola. Um, but if you shake hands, touch someone that's infected, um, and they touch soft tissue or other things, um, it'll, it'll maybe transmit. Uh, in the spring of 2014, um, you know, in this little village where this little boy was in Guinea, um, the disease started to take off. Um, and by, by now, you know, February, March time frame, we were hearing about it, but it was pretty isolated. And for about the prior 40 years to 2014, we had heard about cases of Ebola mostly happening in these little bespoke villages and places. And what tended to happen was it would sort of sweep through the village and then end there. It wouldn't tend to go on to the, the next village or the next place. Um, 
uh, but 2014 was different. Uh, in, 20, in 2014, uh, saw the rise of people getting into cars and motorcycles and driving to look for care and, and moving around. And eventually, a bull like got into uh, the cities. Um, we'll get there. Uh, but in the U.S., in the fall of 2014, uh, once that started to happen and we started to hear a little bit more about Ebola and the threat of Ebola, um, things were a bit crazy. And domestically, um, you know, it was all over the news. People were going nuts. If you remember in 2014, um, you know, there, there was a case of a person coming into Texas with Ebola, a nurse who was infected um, from contacting another person, a cameraman, some doctors working in the field um, in Africa were infected and, and uh, largely were were uh, you know there were governors you know threatening to lock people up if they if they showed up and had come back from the field et cetera which was really thwarting our our uh, our ability to get out there but more importantly what was happening in in West Africa was that infected people were moving to the cities looking for care and not finding it because the fragility of some of these these health systems um, uh, there was a lot of disbelief and misinformation. Uh, people out in the periphery of the country didn't think Ebola was real. They would think it was made up. It was a, it was a you know, public influence campaign versus a, versus a real health crisis. Um, there were lots of cultural practices that were amplifying the problem. Uh, burial practices in a lot of the world uh, mean that when you pass away, and the way a loved one cares for you typically is uh, giving you a bath and cleaning you up and putting you in fresh clothes and nice sheets and getting you ready. The problem with that is if you have a bowl and someone does that, they tend to infect all the people that have touched you. There are some, some practices of laying hands on people um, if they've passed away. That's another uh, practice that was amplifying the problem. Uh, we were also approaching summer in West Africa in the fall of 2014. Our winter, of course, is their summer. Um, and lots of heat, lots of uh, migrant workers, uh, lots of uh, uh, airborne insects that present that, that pass other diseases and that present just like Ebola that created the problem. Um, but our main problem was there was no reliable information coming out of the field. We really didn't know in the fall of 2014 where the cases were, uh, who had Ebola, where it was moving, you know, where to build a treatment center, where to put a lab, where to get supplies going, and, and uh, or any of that. We just it was a fog. It was just sort of looking into a looking into a fog in, in West Africa. Uh, the CDC was starting to do some quick epidemiological research um, in some of these places. Um, and in the fall, like August, September, October, they were predicting um, about 25,000 ca new cases a day uh, by, the end of the, by the end of that year of 2014, if we didn't act. Um, and you can only imagine that not only is that a health crisis for West Africa, but you know, one of those people get on an airplane and fly to an India or a militarized zone somewhere in the world, and it becomes quickly not a health crisis, but a military crisis or a, a you know a humanitarian crisis of such a large scale, just because the transmission was so rampant and, uh, and people were passing it um, around. And so it was, it was really, really a scary time. And when I left the, uh, I, I left the White House, I was there for about four years as the U.S. Chief Information Officer, and then I was Deputy of OMB, as, as John said. And uh, as I was leaving, I did this most surreal thing I've ever done in my life, and I wrote my resignation letter to the President, which I outlasted most political appointees by like two years at that point. And, uh, and so I sort of handed it over, and his response was, great, I'll accept it if you go to West Africa and work on Ebola, so don't quit a job if you work for President Obama is the key, key, key of that. No, um, no it's, the proud, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my life, as you can imagine. Uh, but it was, it, was, uh, it was really just confusing at the time. Um, there I am in the White House talking about some of this stuff. And so one of the first things I did, because I was the, the first task for me was um, was the as the uh, chief innovation officer of USAID on this response, I quickly assembled a bunch of people from the tech community in the U.S. to try to understand how can we you know get our arms around this. What are best practices? What are people doing in development space in tech, et cetera, to 
to go in and, and kind of understand uh, diseases in West Africa. So I brought together a bunch of tech companies and a bunch of people that had kind of worked at that intersection of development and technology. And it gave us a lot of, lot of advice. It's like, hey, you should create mobile applications and give those to people or deploy them on phones in West Africa. You should you know, look at all the data sources everywhere and sort of harmonize data and understand kind of like what, what is the data telling you across all that. Um, you should use geolocation and do GPS tagging of different cases and stuff. You should you know, develop lots of smart maps. Uh, you know, somebody said, like, go in and, and comb all the social media. People should be posting to Twitter and Facebook if they're getting Ebola or their family members die, and we can come through and understand that. Um, and somebody said, like, let's deploy drones and like fly around and see if we can see people that have Ebola. Uh, as you can imagine, most of these things were really bad ideas. Um, but it speaks to kind of how we often you know, attack problems like this and try to get under the heart of, of what are these problems and how, how do you take them on. I think anyone, you know, if you're in you know, San Francisco, you'd certainly say that is the right list to do to, to go and understand these, these problems. But understanding these environments and really getting your hands on them really takes one core thing, and that's know your customer. You really got to know and have empathy for your operating environment. And I, I'll never trust anyone who's written a white paper or done anything, you know, talking about development, talking about, about products, or anything, if they haven't dove in and lived among the people that they're trying to trying to work with um, on things. And so. Uh, so the first thing I did was after I had that series of meetings, I just I got on a plane and went to Liberia. And what you found out was that drones and internet and cell phones and apps and all that, of course, were not going to going to be the solution. About you know, uh, Liberia itself, probably 70, 80 percent of the land mass in 2014 didn't have cell service, um, and, uh, and that was coupled with most of the cell towers were uh, were built by this company called Safaricom, but maintained by Huawei, the Chinese company. Once the Ebola started to happen, they all pulled their engineers out, so nobody was maintaining these networks. Um, and, uh, and so they were just failing all over the place, and you couldn't, you'd often get a signal in a place, but then not even be able to use it. It was just, just very, very strange in, in certain places. And so I'll just click through a few of the photos from places when we were there. That's my friend Eric King, Dr. King is his name, uh, but he, uh, before you go into any building, the first thing you had to do is wash your hands with uh, bleach water. So it's like Clorox and water, you'd wash your hands, and I still can't walk by a laundry room or a laundromat and smell Clorox and not think of, uh, of West Africa, and the Clorox would eat away at your jackets and your shirts and all that over the course of the day. Uh, and then there was always a military officer po uh, pointed outside of, the, outside of the facilities that you would go into and they would take your temperature, uh, non-contact, it was like a little gun that went at your head, um, take your temperature and then write it on a piece of paper and staple it to your clothing. And so by the end of the day, you would have all these pieces of paper, depending on how many buildings you've gone into, stapled to yourself. Um, that would show you the, uh, I was going to the telecommunications authority, speaking of cell phones, uh, in that picture, as you can see. Um, Lots of, we were just starting to build these Ebola treatment units, um, these centers that uh, basically had um, uh, a tent for people that were probable cases, possible cases, a tent for probable cases, and a tent for confirmed cases. Um, and then we had a, 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 the only air-conditioned tent that existed on the, on the facility was a, was a morgue to handle the, anyone that passed away while in there. Um, but by the fall of 2014, in my first trip, one of the things I noticed was locals were starting to really pay attention to the fact that Ebola was real. Um, a group of Liberians had launched a campaign uh, getting local uh, like music talent to sing songs on radio. There was a kind of song that was created called Ebola is Real. Um, and people were starting to put posters up and, and uh, this, as you can see, this taxi cab had, a, had a painted, painted their bumper, there were billboards. Um, this was the very first Ebola treatment unit, official one that USAID built. The very first one was actually at the Firestone uh, rubber plant, um, uh, where they were harvesting rubber trees. Um, but this is the first one USAID built. That's the Ministry of Defense building in the background. Liberia went through a very, <clears throat> very messy civil war, and uh, that building was burnt out in that civil war. And the, the grounds of it made 
made a good uh, good place to uh, to create the first treatment center, and that was the first one. Um, this is what it what it looked like inside one of the tents without any patients in it. Um, when we finished, all this chem chem cloth uh, sort of sort of material that you could spray down with hoses and Clorox and and, uh, and sanitize after after people had been through. That was one we had just finished. See lots of lots of signs and sat with me smiling with the satellite phone and the rare moment I thought I'd never break. <laughs> this is where uh, you know, a, a general 101st Airborne was involved in the response and we're touring a, a treatment center that the librarians had built with our uh, with our investment. This is the west end of uh, of Monrovia, Liberia, one of the poorest places and where the where the disease really spread when it first uh, first took off. I'm talking to the head of the telecom authority there, or the um, library and telco, the telecom company that, that oversaw that. So the bottom line of all these photos was really just that we had to get there. We had to understand what was going on to really attack this disease and to, to take it to the next level. And so what we what we did basically from that is kind of throwing that playbook we we had sort of initially developed out from the from the uh, uh, tech companies is we started to write a new playbook to say what are the things we really need to do to kind of transform the way this response is handled how do we get data how do we communicate to people how do we break through in these ways and so we kind of created these sort of transformation lines for ourselves which was first to just always assume our initial assumptions were wrong. Just always make that assumption that if we get data, it's probably wrong. Let's figure out why it's wrong and how we can we, we can correct it. Um, and do lots of validation with data. That we knew that was our most important thing was just get data flowing, understand where the cases are, where 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 this stuff is happening, and move from there. Our second one was really about just disrupting static industries or efforts through inclusion and diversity. That's a long way of saying basically my tagline when I was in the federal government, which is break the rules, don't break the laws, um, which is let's just, let's just figure, you know, the, the, the way of doing things is probably not the way that you need to do them in the future. And, and the way you do disruption in the software industry, um, the way you do it in all kinds of different industries is basically just don't run the plays that you ran before, run new ones or at least in your portfolio of old plays, have one crazy one that you can go try and see what happens. And for us to, to, you know, to really tackle our first thing with data, that was part of that. Um, but we were really thinking about how do we take kind of an old development-minded, you know, static uh, processes, you know, that the, the, nothing against the CDC and their process, process for, you know, measuring this stuff, but the forms they would use and go into the field with to do their epidemiological studies and surveys was you know, seven to 10 pages long. And sitting down with a family member or a patient or something and going through that stuff is really important to get scientific data behind chains of transmission and understanding all that, but it's not the way to operationalize a response to a, a, an epidemic. Um, and so it was really about how do we disrupt all that. So I'm gonna, show, I'm gonna talk about how I, we applied all these in a second. And then number three was basically Stand on the shoulders of what you know work, even if it's basic. And that means if I know, you know, I, I learned a lot working at Microsoft how to market to customers, how to know our customers, and to, to get things out there that they could, they can utilize. Um, like, how can you apply the concepts of social media, the concepts of things that we do, in an environment where there is no internet, or there is no ability to kind of communicate in those ways? You know, you can use social media in, a, in an offline environment. Talk about how we did that. So first, I'll talk about how we applied those kind of three rules. And the first opportunity, as I said, was really about data collection. Just how do we get data flowing? Um, one of the first things we did. And this is a picture of a whiteboard that we did in, in Monrovia. Was basically map all the data from the from the country. And you'll see in there, you'll see like the word Excel. You'll see paper. The word paper. There's a PowerPoint up there. PDF. My name's in there somewhere, email, VHF radio. You can see it's all over the place. And we just wanted to understand like, how is data flowing today? And then if we understand how it flows, we can start to make it better. Um, and, and we can move, move between uh, this stuff. Uh, the, uh, 
Yeah, so it was incredible. These are ETUs as Ebola treatment units. This was all at the Ministry of Health. And then it would come to me and my team in DC here. So, pretty complex. So what we basically did to disrupt that was to say, you know, what, what can we do? How can we go out and get, get uh, information flowing? And what ended up happening was SMS, texting was our killer app. It was the killer app of the Ebola response. It's what we ended up using to both transmit data and to get data in initially. So those few places, that 40% of the landmass that did have some version of cell service. And in those early days, when I got first got there, I would fly around in a, on a Blackhawk and we'd just like land over there and we'd go out and I'd pull out a cell phone, a handful of cell phones and I would check to see do I have any kind of cell service here and we'd start to map that. And then we worked with a group called NetHope um, that actually did some other mapping, helped us maintain some of this stuff and get, get communications going. Um, but it was, it was incredible, our ability to, to build on these systems, to send information out. And then in SMS, you can always send people information that says, you know, reply one if you have this, reply two if you have that, or whatever. And, and so we did that. My, the, the little temperature tag you saw for the telecom authority was me going into um, the equivalent of their FCC, Communications Commission, and getting permission to use short codes uh, so, so residents in Liberia wouldn't have to pay to text us back information or to receive our text. Um, and so we established a bunch of short codes and, and it gave us the option to do that. If you go to Africa, it's not, it, in this part of Africa, the, it, it's, uh, you don't pay like a monthly cell phone bill like you do here. There you go to these little booths and you buy like what looks like a lottery ticket with a scratch off and you, you basically buy a number of minutes, um, international calling plans, data, et cetera. And for a few dollars you can get X number of minutes, scrape off the card, enter in the whole code, and your phone is unlocked for that many minutes. And so, and so we didn't want people to have to do that, and so we, we got short codes and, and enabled SMS. For people that had more feature phones, we were able to do um, data back and forth as well, both through SMS and through other, other apps, um, through a platform that UNICEF developed called Rapid Pro that actually was, was built for uh, use with uh, uh, maternal maternal purposes. So, Rapid Pro was a was a, 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 was an app that allowed UNICEF to send moms, new, you know, new moms, a, an alert when they were supposed to have their baby checked out or uh, vaccination schedules, things like that. And so we repurposed it, uh, partnering with UNICEF to um, both send and receive information in the field. The second big opportunity for us uh, was communications and outreach. Um, and this was about how do we get the word out to people that you know Ebola is real? How do we tell them to look look for the signs of Ebola? What are practices? You know, we were basically trying to change a lot of cultural practices across the entire country um, in weeks, uh, which you know, takes generations to, to do. Um, and so that that was a, a huge lift to, to think about that. And um, so part of that, this is a net hope person working on the, the satellite uplink, so part of getting that data flowing was getting some communications out in certain areas, which we were able to do. But most of the time, it was a very, very analog process. So, you know, instead of web, webcasting or doing a podcast or having a, you know, YouTube live, you just go to a town and tell people, you know, let's, let's all get together and talk a little bit about Ebola and what it means. You can see a guy over there on the right-hand side in the blue shirt holding a sign that's, um, I'll, I'll, you'll see the sign in a second. This is a, a picture of, we, we utilize radio a lot and got um, soccer stars and others to come on the radio and talk about Ebola being real, talk about what to look for, what, how to change behavior um, in, uh, in the, way we, uh, the way we did things. We posted, literally, this is very, this is like a cheeky Facebook joke, but we posted on walls um, so people could, could see uh, um, see this information, so we printed these posters, put them all over the place, had an infographic uh, professional, make sure that if people couldn't read, they could still look at the pictures and get a sense of, of what to do and what not to do. Um, and so those were on there as well. And here's the, here's the, the poster that was distributed. Like, do, not, do not play with monkeys and baboons. 
um, there was a there was a cultural practice around some people eating bush meat, so killing a bat and eating it, maybe it's undercooked, you could get a bola from that. Um, uh, there were lots of, lots of that kind of stuff. And then the, the third opportunity was really around rapid diagnostics. And this was, you know, one of the challenges we had there in diagnostics was to test for Ebola, it took a, what's called a PCR test. And if you're ever in a US hospital and they take a blood sample from you, they go, oh, we're gonna run it to the lab. What they're running it to is a PCR machine, which is a, which is any, it ranges in size, but they're about the size of a chest freezer, like a, you'd see in a home, um, like a big, big machine, takes a lot of energy, it's a very complex <laughs> process of analyzing, um, as analyzing blood samples, not portable in any sort of way. Um, and uh, our, our problem with PCR for Ebola was we, we could put PCR machines in Liberia, but the question is where do you put them? Where's the reliable power? How do you, how can you get blood turn, blood test turnarounds? So when we started in the fall, we were testing blood, but it took about four days to turn blood around from going to a lab and then coming back to the person that was where the blood was drawn, if Ebola kills you in five days, you're gone by the time your blood's back. And so we have no idea if people are, are able to do this. The US military has a, has a policy around flying possibly infected blood on their aircraft, helicopters and things. So we couldn't use the military to fly the samples. We thought that would be a way of kind of moving them quickly. And so we had to use that, that first approach of, of the data flows. And the way that data ended up flowing ultimately in Ebola was not only through SMS, but we, we basically drew a map of the country and said for each county, um, Liberia is made up of a series of counties, they each have like a county seat, a county headquarters, you know, a town, their village in the middle of the county that is the, the center. We designated a, a community health person in each of those areas to be the person who collects data for their county. Um, and then if they had cell service, we got them text back in. If they had more internet-based services, we had gave them apps to upload the data. Um, sometimes this happened in doctors that were out there. Um, and it, but in most cases, it was people on motorcycles who drive out, they grab a notepad, and they drive it back in. And all of a sudden, we had almost every day, we would get a, we'd get a daily situation report. We stayed, started to understand where are the cases? Where are they moving? How many are happening in these certain places? And from that, we then knew where to go drop these PCR machines. And so the US Navy has shipping container labs that have a PCR machine, a generator, all that kind of stuff that you can take a helicopter and like drop it in with six of those. And we position them in strategic locations around the country. And then we'd go and we would build these Ebola treatment units in places where we thought the uptick was going to happen. When I showed you that picture um, of that empty Ebola treatment unit, that's the one we were touring. We had, they had just finished it like that day um, when I was there. And there hadn't been a single case in that village. It was uh, Grand Cape Mount County. It was the northern end of, uh, end of Liberia. And, uh, and like two weeks later, that thing was full. It was full of people. Just amazing how fast like a fire it went through um, but our data showed us that that was probably going to happen and we were able to kind of understand that both from the data and other trends like uh, migrant farmers would come migrant workers would come across the border to work in palm oil fields and different things like that so we knew we kind of knew what was going to happen based on this data um, and so we were able to drop these these things in but the other approach we took was to say and this is where you just do the basic stuff we it's common sense in a lot of ways, was to say, you know, we can't get a PCR machine into uh, every location, every county. It's just not practical from the standpoint of the people that takes to run it, and et cetera. But we can put rapid diagnostic tests that test for malaria, yellow fever, all these things, these very small field tests that, they have, that, that the community has to uh, test for everything else. Let's eliminate all those. Let's take the person's blood and see if they have one of the other ones. And if they do, let's get them out of the out of the uh, possible Ebola tent, because it's likely they're going to get Ebola if they, if they go there. And so there was a, so we did that and while we also back here on the home front in DC worked with the science community on, uh, on uh, rapidly testing and certifying new devices to test Ebola. And now, now we have some, the world has some really probable uh, uh, machines that can actually do field tests uh, for Ebola pretty, in a, in a pretty reliable
reliable way. The key there, in a lot of ways, is just access to test material. You know, here in the U.S., we have vials. In D.C., we have vials of a Volvo over an NIH, you know, that can be used for testing, but um, we aren't making those readily available for lots of people, so we had to build a program to do that very quickly. And then the last opportunity was around personal protective equipment. This was actually one that, that President Obama was really, um, he had heard from doctors, talked to doctors. There was a famous photo of him hugging the nurse that had Ebola and from the South, you remember that, after, after she was cured. Um, and uh, this is one that he had heard from a lot of people was a real pain. The Ebola suit um, that, uh, that you see people wear, saw people wearing in 2014, still see it in the Congo today. Uh, is, the, is a suit that's basically made of a Tyvek. It's a you know, chemical uh, proofing material that, um, that has all this, this coatings on it, all these coatings on it that basically don't allow any vi virus, doesn't allow a virus uh, transmitted through liquid through to your, to your body. Um, and uh, so basically what you do is you put on, you, know, you wear whatever, you put on the Tyvek suit over the front, has a zipper up the front, so you zip it up, and then there's like this tape that tapes over the zipper, uh, one-time use, so that once you've done that, it doesn't really open anymore. Um, and then you put on a, uh, like a, a mask that you see doctors wearing, um, and then there's a hood that you pull over your head, and you cut a hole in the hood so your mask can stick out through the front of the hood. Um, and then you, uh, and you put goggles on over that, you put another mask on over that one, so you're double masked. So you have an inner mask and an outer mask to protect that area. Um, you then put on double gloves, two, two sets of gloves, wrap chem tape around your wrists so no, no, nothing can get in that seam, um, and then uh, and put rubber boots on, chem tape around the rubber boots, and then typically, because there's that seam up the front and you don't want the virus to get in the seam somehow, you wear this big, heavy rubber like apron on the front of you, um, and then you've got goggles over that. Um, you see the goggles there in the lower left. Um, and so what, what happens when you're in that environment and wearing these suits, like the, you can see the apron and the mask and all that on the, on the right hand side. When you're in that environment and wearing that in an African summer outdoors in an air con non-air conditioned um, uh, you know, tent or treatment unit, uh, the, the main problem is you get really hot. And, and you can last about 30 minutes in one of these suits in this environment, um, mostly due to the fact that one, you can just you get really hot enough that you actually get sick and lightheaded and everything else. Your boots start to fill with water from sweating so much inside the suit. Um, your your goggles will fog up. And you're trying to give people IVs and things like that. Um, you can't see through your goggles. <clears throat> but what was amazing was talking to doctors. Uh, uh, there in Liberia, um, they would tell me that their biggest complaint was that the, the patients couldn't see them smile. That they, they couldn't just, they could only see their eyes and they were scary to the patients. And the human to human contact, the ability to smile at another patient, at a, at a patient from you, to say you're doing great or you, you know, get better, or do work on this or that, was a way of comforting people that just wasn't available to them in this, in this way. And, they would say they could see the effects of that um, when dealing with patients. The other main problem you have with the suit is um, is it takes uh, it, you know it takes a little while to put it on because it's pretty complex wrap, wrapping it up. It takes a couple people to help you get it on, but taking it off takes about thirty to forty five minutes. Um, and so you're boiling. You, you've worked thirty to forty five minutes in the suit. Now you go out, and there's a whole series of procedures that you go through, being sprayed down with bleach water effectively over and over again as you pull each layer off, hoping that you don't get any of the disease in because a little, you know, a little bit of virus, you know, around the edge getting in your eye or something, which is the biggest risk, it was the eye of the bottle, uh, will give you Ebola. And, and, and many healthcare workers got Ebola that way. Was, uh, was doing this. And so what we did to, to basically disrupt that was um, uh, we decided to re, you know, kick off an effort to redesign the Ebola suit. Um, and so we invited, uh, we did a two-day exercise here in D.C. where we invited uh, doctors from Liberia that had put these suits on over and over again and taken them off to basically show us putting them on and taking them off. And then we invited to this, to this two-day workshop 
uh, not only the, the Kimberly Clarks of the world and all the people that make these suits for hospitals in the United States, but we reached out to sporting good companies like Under Armour came. We uh, reached out to, to uh, people that made like cooling vests for race car drivers. And, you know, when like, NASCAR drivers drive around the track, they're wearing a vest that circulates cool air, cool water around themselves. There's like a cooler of ice water behind them that has a pump on it and circulates this because it gets so hot inside these cars. Um, we invited people from uh, the aerospace industry who do suits for NASA astronauts and uh, and all that, and just just kind of brought everyone to bear on these on this uh, on this problem. And the first day, we just did a tabletop and and showed them putting on the suit, taking it off, what the challenges were, talked through that. Um, and then the second day, we spent actually at a makerspace. Um, I don't know if you know you had belonged to or knew Tech Shop down in, in Crystal City, but we went to Tech Shop. Tech Shop. It was very nice in, in uh, donating the tech shop to us. And we made, spent time with the designers basically just, just kind of redesigning the suit. So how do we tackle all these challenges? Now, the smartest thing, one of the smartest things I've ever done in my career is in this, in this second day, and for, oh, for both of these days, but particularly the second day, we invited all the procurement people from DOD who would make this a reality, who'd end up buying this ultimately, the solution, because we knew they would be, you know, give us rapid feedback on like, what are the tests you'd want to see? What are the things you'd want to you'd want to accomplish? And how would you how would you manage this? And so this is the suit that ended up uh, we when we put some investment dollars behind it at USAID as well. And this is the suit that ended up winning. It was a, a combination of three groups coming together. It's Johns Hopkins uh, Medical, uh, Under Armour, and a wedding dress uh, designer, uh, like seamstress sew a person that sewed it together and. The three of them got together in, in, in partnership with Hopkins and, and designed the suit. What's cool about the suit, uh, I have a little video, I'll skip that for now, but it, it basically is an anti-fogging face, so there's a way of bringing air in the top and going out the mass so it doesn't fog. Um, there's a wicking layer made by Under Armour on the inside, so it kind of keeps you cooler. Um, importantly for the doctors, they told us that they wanted the inside a different color than the outside, so you could tell when you're taking it off which you're touching. Am I touching the inside or the outside here? The, the clean side or the bad side? Um, but the coolest thing about this is the zipper's up the back, um, and there are tabs under the arms. And what you basically do is you rip these tabs off. They're hang down. You bend over, um, pull apart like the seam in the back with your hands, stand on the tabs, and stand up, and the thing just like comes off of you in 30 seconds. It's like it's a really really cool solution. Um, we also designed it for airborne diseases. That was one of our requirements that if, you know, the next phase we had an airborne Ebola or something like that, you want to be able to protect it. And per the doctor's requests, you can't really see it here, but that inner mask is clear. You can actually see the doctor's whole face. Um, many of the doctors in Liberia that I saw were, would take pictures of themselves smiling to their front of their bodies so the patients could see them and write their names on their hoods so everyone knew who the person was, but in a solution like this, which is in production and now, um, you can see all that. So the international response all up beyond the things we did kind of on the innovation front was, you know, was one, building these Ebola treatment units was a big priority. It, um, we also extended out into those communities, those counties, to set up community care centers, that first line of defense before people went to the Ebola treatment uners, units. Um, did a lot of social activation uh, work, both in the, the posters, the radio, the music. You kind of used all these channels to get, get word out. Um, set up rapid response teams to understand what, what, what parts of our system were broken. Uh, we had many times where the daily, daily data situation report, we would like to be, we would not get data from a certain county, and then we'd understand, oh, like, the guy's motorcycle broke down, or oops, I shook this and like that. Um, uh, you know, and, and we'd want to understand all that and be able to get on top of it. Uh, and the, the other thing that was really uh, we we understood from our from our uh, our data was the necessity for safe and dignified burials. Um, uh, instead of people handling and, and touching their loved ones, uh, we encouraged them to call the professionals who would come in and do that in a very dignified way, involving the family, um, but not. Uh, and not disrespecting the loved one, but keeping them away. Our data showed us about 70%, 60 to 70% of the cases were coming from people touching deceased loved ones. And so that was a 
really important thing. And that family dynamic actually bled into all kinds of things that we did. And that was a, you know, part of the know your customer, I think is really grounded in the sense of empathy around connecting to these people. Like when we first built these Ebola treatment units, it had those three tents. Um, and uh, in many cases, someone would call and say, I think my family member has Ebola. They'd go in and that, they'd never see that person again. They would just go into the system and then be buried if they died, um, which was very likely in the early days. Um, and so what we, so we started to understand that, that people stopped calling the authorities because they didn't want to ever see their loved one again, obviously. But we, you know, people were acting so quickly, we just had to kind of get our arms around the mechanical aspects of managing this crisis when you always forget about the human aspects and how important that is. And so if you were to visit an Ebola treatment unit at the end, and the one I was touring was an example of this, we had a, we had a, a visitor's area basically where we could bring patients out. There was chain link and but an air gap separation so they could see their loved ones, they could talk to them, they could do all that sort of stuff as well. And so that was an important you know, change in thinking about the human aspects and the empathy there. Uh, at the bottom line, too, for me, and this is always important for me to just stress all the time, is West, the West Africans solved this crisis. They were the burial teams. They were the community health workers. They were largely the ones working extra hours longer than the Western doctors in the, in the treatment units. Um, uh, they were the ones commanding the, you know, the Ministry of Health and the, rapid, the, the command center and all that. Uh, we just helped them. You know, we helped bring some... some different solutions and different things. Um, and I think if you look into any crisis, coming into that any crisis and in, in our ability you know, in the West to help uh, in any way around the world, it's important to always understand that they're the ones who are gonna fix it. We just need to give them, you know, give them a little leg up uh, to do that. So a little bit on the future of, of response in global health is something I, I think a little bit about in, in my work now and, and what we're doing at, at Rockefeller and in other places. Uh, and and we, um, we also, and I'm happy to share this with the team here to distribute to any of you, uh, one of the things we did early on uh, in, the, in the crisis is hired a, a university uh, duo to come with us and kind of tag team with us and write down best practices and just sort of record what we were doing to see if, you know, if we learned anything, as we because we're moving so quickly, we want to kind of capture some of that. They did a report at the end, it kind of captured many of the things I talked about in this talk and, and, and done some, have, have sort of written a playbook for if this happens, what to do. Um, one of the things we were really kicking off kind of near the end was, was working with the defense uh, infrastructure and biosurveillance. Uh, the U.S. Department of Defense does one of the most comprehensive bio, biosurveillance programs on the planet. And, and largely because, you know, if we're going to send soldiers into a certain area, they want to know, is there malaria there, is there whatever, and what do we need to do to, before they go? Any of you have been in the military and you get the shots before you go into theater, like I did going into West Africa. That that's always, always happens. Uh, early warning systems is something that we put into place um, in Liberia. So, so having them, you know, keep this community-based reporting infrastructure that report to the Ministry of Health and having people report you know, when children are dying or when other things are happening, it starts to raise red flags. It took, took the world uh, you know, from about this time in, in, uh, in 2014 to really about September of 2014, so about six months, to really come to grips with the fact that this was real and we needed to get on top of it or it was going to be a worldwide pandemic. Um, and so early warning systems are, are important. Working with these local communities on strengthening health systems couldn't be more important and helping, you know, uh, do a lot of that. If you ever go to a village and, and see a community health worker, they often have like three giant log books and four cell phones because every NGO gives them a different way of like community and doing all this stuff. There's all this stuff we can do to make that better and something we care a lot about data sharing, broadband mobile build out as an aftermath of, of uh, of uh, our work in Liberia, Google went in and did a fiber ring in Monrovia to connect all the government buildings and, and kind of uh, we helped inspire some of that stuff. Uh, of course, diagnostics and vaccines and connecting the science community rapidly to come to, come to uh, solutions on things like that. Training is couldn't be more important than just making sure that people uh, understand this stuff. And then I'm really personally really excited about the role that uh, artificial intelligence machine learning can, can play in uh, satellite analysis. Uh, one of the things we launched 
at uh, the Rockefeller Foundation is a new company called Atlas AI that actually uses satellite imagery, uh, low Earth orbit satellite imagery, AI machine learning to predict um, uh, crop outcomes in agricultural parts of Africa. So we can we can look at a field uh, and uh, and determine uh, how much corn it's going to yield uh, from the sky. Uh, you know, couple that with like NASA long term weather data and other things, you can suddenly understand you know where a where a um, Famine may happen, and, and maybe bring in food aid before it actually happens, and look at that sort of stuff. And uh, you know, we—I was just in Puerto Rico a couple weeks ago. We're doing some work down there, and it's very easy to fling a satellite over Puerto Rico and just count how many blue tarps are still on roofs. And satellites can see that very easily in the daylight, and uh, and a machine can tell you that color of blue, you know, and, and draw a map and tell you where maybe aid is required still, and, and where you're doing things. Um, Lights on, lights off, very easy for a satellite to see in, at night, um, and all that as well. And so there's lots of possibilities there um, that, uh, that we can take forward. So I, I you know, I, I'll, I'll close with just talking a little bit about this. I, you know, I, as, as John mentioned in my intro, I'm kind of the Forrest Gump of, of like most things in my life. I, I bumbled into different things throughout throughout my journey, and I never thought, you know, growing up in a small town in Iowa that there's more people in the building I work in in New York than the town I grew up in now. Uh, and and uh, uh, I never thought, you know, I'd have the opportunity to work side by side with Bill Gates and travel the world with him and spend lots of time, you know, on the things that he thought about. And the honor of working in the White House for President Obama was a huge you know, honor for me and everything else and now at Rockefeller. But there was no more rewarding time in my life than the six to six or seven months, you know, I spent working on this crisis side by side with librarians. It was moving, meaningful, and, uh, and just gave me an incredible perspective on other parts of my life and, and, uh, and that. And so I encourage all of you, if you ever get the chance, to jump into the fray and, and help out or, or do something, you know, even if it's small and local, um, I, you know, I really recommend doing it. It's, 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 uh, it's a great way to live, so thank you. Three, three quick questions yeah. for you. One is, um, is there a vaccine for Ebola? Second question is, if you catch it, are you going to die or is there a way to cure it? And then, um, I forgot what the third one was. <laughs> <laughs> we'll think of it while I'm on the So, there is a vaccine in trial in, in Africa for Ebola. It's, it's showing really, uh, really good success. Uh, vaccines are always, you know, problematic from a scale scalability and deployment, but um, but I think I think this one shows a lot of promise. Um, and then on the second one, if you if you catch Ebola, you're going to die. The the likelihood of death in uh, August of 2014 and uh, and today is orders of magnitude different. I think this this light here. Okay, remember. Um, and, and basically, there's there's antivirals, and uh, and what we've learned is if you can pump enough fluid into a person along with a cocktail of antivirals, and maintain and manage that in in relatively real time, which is much easier in, in a developed hospital than a field hospital, you can actually save people. We were saving people. That those handprints at that last that last photo were literally survivors would come out and. Back then, there were just a few of them, but I saw boards like that that were just filled with hands and, and people that had survived uh, the virus. So the, the third question was, you, you mentioned that uh, family members could die from touching the body. Um, so how long did this virus last after, you know, I mean, does it, does it just go on or does it we're, actually? Actually, if you, if you go read the news, it, and this is what I understand just from reading the news, not being a scientist or a doctor, but it, it, um, it seems to, we don't really know, I think. Um, so we, we did, there were people that had survived it who then worked in treatment units um, afterwards, um, relatively unprotected. Uh, but what, what we found out was like in their inner eye, there was still active virus. In their semen for males, there was still active virus. Um, and uh, and the, it's, it's, it's very curious. Uh, we set up a special cemetery in Monrovia to bury the patients because um, the, we believe that the virus actually lasts quite a while. Um, so there's, 
I, I don't think we really know that we, you know, the community, science community had been studying it for about 40 years prior to, uh, prior to the 2014 outbreak. And we didn't, when it went through that many people, we didn't know, you know, would it start to transform and mutate and become a different virus altogether. And so it was, it was kind of touch and go, um, largely because we didn't know a lot about it. I have two questions. The suit that you guys um, are designing, the anti-fog breathing layer, what is the name of that suit and when is it going to actually be uh, I'll pull up the name for you, actually. I have it in, like, in a, a, one of the appendix slides. Uh, uh, but it's, it's, I think it is in production. Hopkins is, is uh, basically producing it with the military. Okay. And I think it's deployed. We have, one of the things we noticed during the crisis was that US hospitals were over-ordering the, the what are called PPEs, that, mm -hmm. that set of suit, that set of uh, pieces that became that suit that you saw early on. Um, and so the, the, we were running out of them in the, in the US, which meant we were really running out of them internationally because they weren't shipping them. And so we set up these sort of depots across the US working with the uh, uh, NIH and others. Are these something that's, you know, you can get GSA, I mean, how? That was the plan. I, okay. you know, I left the administration before they actually produced them because they weren't they weren't ready by the time the last patient left the hospital in Liberia, which is when I left. And the second question is: um, you said there was a best practice report that came out. Um, pulling from that best practice report, how effective has that been in the new outbreak? Uh, it's been effective from the standpoint of, and I, we've actually helped some folks in the Congo. Um, with understanding this, um, what we saw happening was they were ra able to rapidly uh, deploy um, uh, kind of these communications mechanisms and data mechanisms to get people to understand it. Um, it was very easy to convince the locals that it was real. Um, that was another thing that took a while in, in Liberia, months in Liberia, to and Guinea and Sierra Leone to get the locals to understand that this was a real threat. It was real. Uh, a lot of the cultural practices and those things were much easier to communicate in that context, and a lot of those things were were transmitted. Every environment is different. That's part of the part of the challenge we all have is we try to do a one size fits all, and you you find out that even Guinea, Sierra Leone, and in and, uh, and Liberia were different in their in their makeup, cultural practices, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so, it's, it, best practices docs only go so far. But I, I'd say on like communications data. Uh, social outreach, all that stuff was was uh, has been successful to date. Um, the, I'm, I'm saddened by the fact that the U.S. is not involved very much in this. Um, it's, a, so it's an opportunity for us to help. I, think. I don't know who I ended up first. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, my question is regarding the the base of the disease, considering that it comes from bats and bat guano, is such a lucrative industry. Um, you mentioned that you weren't sure, or it wasn't known how the boy had gotten contaminated in the beginning that caused the initial outbreak. With the bats and their migration patterns and causing them to evacuate their caves at random points during the day, I know that you said the majority of cases came from human to human. Is there a correlation that's associated with bats migration and any concern from a bat to bat transmission that those bats, I know Florida's got a huge bat issue, for example, that a bat might migrate or a group of them might migrate and cause an influx of the disease elsewhere because the bats are the root of the issue? We, we don't know, how, like for example, how it maybe moved from West Africa to uh, to the Congo. It could have been that way, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, it's actually a question I haven't really thought much about, but it's a good question to, to raise. The bats also, um, you know, by primates and and, and that, that primates was, yeah. can have uh, can have Ebola. Um, and that would be the other the other concern is can the animals that might find a corpse of an individual who's died from this and they consume part of that corpse is that animal capable of spreading and becoming a most mammals no but primates yes and primates I don't think I, really are yeah. mostly vegetarian I think um, so it probably wouldn't happen that way I think they the get it through bat bat bite transmission. Um, is how I understand it. And do we know how the bats end up developing Ebola? I don't know if bats were the originator of the Ebola, uh, or it started in primates, or what what have you. There just happened to be the only mammal that can carry it and not trans and not uh, die from it. Die from it. Yeah. Um, actually, the U.S. Uh, philanthropist unfortunately passed away, and was a friend of mine, uh, Paul, Paul Allen, the co-founder of Microsoft, uh, with Bill Gates. Um, he got involved very early on, and largely because he was funding. Uh, he does a lot on animal science and was funding some research in, 
on Ebola in primates, and a scientist who was paying attention to Africa at the time in the primate population alerted him that this was like a real thing, and he got very, very involved and helped us a lot. He funded all the uh, special evacuation planes that had like a little mini treatment unit in the back to get our doctors and stuff into the back to the U.S. Yeah. My question kind of centers to the diplomacy through aid side. It seemed that the U.S. was certainly kind of the leader with the Liberians in terms of the international efforts on the ground for the first crisis. Did you see, or who, I guess, I'm sure there were, who did you see also, either international perspective or government stepping up in that first crisis? And you said there's an opportunity in the DRC currently. Is any other government or kind of country stepping into that, stepping into that position? Yeah, um, so the, there were sort of uh, four main, act, I'd say four to five main actors um, in the 2014 crisis. The UN uh, was, a, was a big actor. They, they actually started, they actually ran a little bit of an experiment and started a new organization called UNMIR, the UN Mission for the Emergency Ebola Response. Um, that was, head, it was headquartered in Accra, Ghana, um, and which I think was sort of mistake number one, that should have been closer to the, the theater, not that Accra is not too far from West, that part of West Africa. Um, but uh, so they, they created an organization to track it and, and to work there. Uh, the World Health Organization, of course, um, and then uh, the three countries, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and, and Liberia, were divided up by three countries. Uh, uh, so we, we oversaw Liberia. Uh, Guinea was the French, and Sierra Leone were the British. And uh, we worked sort of side by side with them, sharing best practices and, and doing different things. I'd say there was some variability in how much each of the each of our teams uh, took a reliance on the UN as the infrastructure. I think we didn't take a deep reliance on the UN. We worked side by side with them, and that, that was a pretty effective, especially like our work with UNICEF and other right. things. Um, and of course, running supplies and UN flights and all that stuff. You should imagine all the commercial air flight stopped, um, and so we we coordinated kind of kind of as a as a core partner. Uh, there were others that sort of UN led the effort in Guinea and Sierra Leone, and the countries that were involved maybe followed a little bit. But but at the end, you know, everyone was successful in different ways. So that was good. Yes. I just wanted to get your thoughts on what's currently happening in North Kivu as we start to kind of look at now the second largest Ebola epidemic, and we're really sitting on the precipice of what could happen, what happened in 2014, just kind of your thoughts. Because it feels almost like history is repeating itself again. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'd love to hear your perspective on it. <laughs> you probably have as, as, as good or better perspective on it than I do. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think that the bottom line is that the world is becoming more and more interconnected. There is a mass movement to urbanization around the planet. We tipped over, like in the last, I think, three years, over 50% of the world population lived in cities um, uh, versus, like, in the early century, last last century, it was a very small percentage lived in cities, mostly rural populations as a percentage. And so, you're starting to see this density movement, you know, meets weak health systems, um, and then. You know, it's just the geopolitical environment. Um, so, you know, I, I, won't, I promise I won't get political here and, and, and give you my rough perspective of the U.S. But it, but it's, um, I think it's 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 kind of an all hands on deck. There's a necessity for an all hands on deck approach for all of us to look at these things and to say we must we must kind of jump in to to, to help and to uh, help these countries not only strengthen their health systems, build early warning systems, help with all this stuff. <laughs> Um, but also the uh, the necessity to kind of provide direct aid in, in many cases. And I mean, the, the theme of the building you're sitting in here is, is sort of the approach to soft power and what the importance that leading with a bag of rice or some medicine in your hand is, is more powerful than a, a gun, you know, after the fact. And, and uh, I think it's, it's uh, you know, this world getting smaller and more connected meets, you know, kind of a, a Know, sense of nationalism, closed closed doors is not a not a good combination ultimately for where we need to go. So she told me last question. I, That's a quick can I break? John's got a question. I can give you the last. So, one. Steve, I wanted to uh, uh, ask you about who did the cultural intelligence collection, and 
who figured out the optimal ways of communicating with people? I imagine that the locals did some of this, but somebody had to tell you and the other you know, European officials, the UN officials about this, had to impress upon everybody the importance of doing this. And, and I, I'm, I'm interested in this because we have really waxed and waned as a country when it comes to our ability to communicate with foreign audiences. Yep. And we have really underinvested in this type of public diplomacy. And we uh, have shut down a lot of, we shut down the U.S. Information Agency. It had an important unit of audience research, which, you know, and, and you know, in our armed forces we have our military information support teams, which used to be called psychological operations, may be called psyops again. But these are people who are basically paying attention to these psychological uh, aspects, to to cultural proclivities, and so on. And and the sensitivity to this seems to have been a major factor in your ability to be effective. How did that happen? So. Um a little of it was local, like we would talk to the, the people locally and, and get some insights, but the, the play we ended up running, which was just a delightful one, um, was there were rich diaspora communities here in the U.S. Um, uh, for, you know, in, in uh, one of the largest groups of Sierra Leoneans live in Baltimore. And so in South Philadelphia and Minneapolis are some uh, really central to Liberian community. I drive around Monrovia and like every third person was wearing a Minnesota Vikings t-shirt. <laughs> it's like, it's like hey, there's something going on in Minnesota here. And so you, uh, what, what we did is we actually brought in to the Ronald Reagan building groups of people uh, to do focus groups. And I ran, we did sort of the very similar to what we would have done in product marketing, you know, back in the day to, to talk to people in product marketing and just said like, you know, What's your perspective on this? How would this go over? What should we, who should we reach out to? And this is, especially in Sierra Leone, we started to understand the, the, the role that sort of tribal chiefs played and, they, and how, that, how they interacted with like local, um, local government and local religious leaders. And that interplay is a very delicate one. And if you can walk that appropriately and respectfully, you can get a lot of impact very fast. And so understanding like, which of the buttons do you push to get to get stuff to happen, when you land your Black Hawk helicopter in a village, which hand should you shake first? Or in Liberia, we can shake hands. You bump elbows. That was our handshake. Um, but it, uh, you know, that that was important to understand which which person you reached out to first, which you connected to, and that was all from the people in the diaspora community. It was was our was our. I know there's a wealth of other kind of opportunities out there, but that was the one we used the most. Did you do this personally, or did you have people at USAID be essentially the, the representatives who were doing this cultural intelligence? A little of both, I would say. Um, we didn't have really a division of cultural intelligence. Um, we definitely had the foreign service officers who work in the embassies in these places, and and all of that that come back with a rich, rich set of understandings and things. Um, but for me, it's always about talk to the real person that's actually doing the doing the stuff. And you know, I, I helped I helped in the group that launched the first Xbox, for example, and and uh, at Microsoft, and um, saw it from the beginning all the way to the launch. And one of the things we understood was like we started to put Xboxes in people's living room. You could talk to gamers in a conference room or look at them behind like two-way mirrors while they're being interviewed by a, by a person. But when you sit in their living room and you realize, because the original Xboxes had cords going from the controller to the box, they would do some you know, sports move and the box would go flying off their top of their television to their shelf, go <laughs> crashing to the ground. You realize, oh, we should probably fix that. Like that didn't ever came through any focus group. You know, it's just, it's just what you saw when you actually got there and actually like observed and, and did things. And I think sitting down with people that just have intimate knowledge um, is uh, couldn't be more important to, to understand. And I, I spent last two weeks ago, I spent an entire day with Jose Andres driving around Puerto Rico and visiting his farms and all the things. That, as you know, his World Central Kitchen and the team there has done an incredible job in Post Maria providing food and all that. And we, we sort of in the discussion of 
a food aid as it relates to dropping the MREs, the C ration, meal re meals ready to eat, those packaged foods versus actually making someone a local dish that they maybe like and, and how that's different and cost effective and things. And the emotional response people get in an aid situation where you're feeding them something that they like versus breaking open. I know there's people that are on the edge of death and need you know, sustenance really fast and it's easier to drop MREs out of a helicopter than a big thing of paella or something. But it's but it's uh, but that that connection, that human connection, the empathy that associates with it, I think is the core of diplomacy, the core of, of foreign aid, the, the core of like, you know, how we need to sort of think about society going forward. So. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.